Howdy, how's it going? My name is Davy Chappie, and it's time to go over the last four classes buffed up in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. I'm gonna go over the new class features and archetypes of the Rogue, the Sorcerer, the Warlock, and the Wizard. And as always, keep in mind that the majority of this is just my opinion, so if you feel like the next book should be comprised of just 18 more Wizard subclasses, feel free to play your games however you want. But with that out of the way, let's begin. So, to start things off with the last martial character before we get to the Arcane Triumvirate, the Rogue only gains one new feature for the base class, and that is the Aim ability, which grants advantage on your next attack as a bonus action if you sacrifice your movement speed. Personally, grant advantage on attacks pretty much every turn feels real weird to me, and I get that the goal was to give rogues a way to get off their sneak attack every turn, but was that really a problem for anybody? It isn't when I play them. Still, it's a personal feeling, and I could go either way with it, so happy hunting. As for subclasses, rogues that go through the full spectrum of edginess come out on the other side as haunted killers, plagued by the whispers of the waking dead and fueled with an unnatural desire to collect more souls like they were pocket monsters. The soul power of the phantom allows you to pick a new skill or tool proficiency every day as you ask the tortured specter of Bob the Builder how to construct the perfect gulag, and your overly edgy presence causes people around your victims to cringe so hard that they take half of your sneak attack damage from the sight of your maniac idiosyncrasies. As it goes, these are your only abilities until halfway through your life as a rogue, at which point your relationship with death grants you the power to, after someone dies around you, capture their soul and manifest it into a tiny trinket that you can use to protect yourself from death, deal more cringe damage, or ask that spirit a question before yeeting it back into the afterlife. By 13th level, you can go ghost like Danny Phantom, and eventually your cringe damage will spread out to an additional person, and those soul trinkets will start finding their way to you on their own. The Phantom, as a subclass, really just throws a bunch of weird ideas together with a vague theme of ghost powers, but given that you'll spend most of your adventure with just the extra damage and the skill swapping features, this class is good for rogues that want to do a little bit of everything, from damage to skills, and if you don't want to be a hot topic stan, you can always just reflavor the ghosts as something else. The subclass that it would be harder to reflavor is the Soul Knife, the second in the trio of psionic classes created as a way for wizards to say please stop asking for the mystic, gaining the iconic psychic energy die that bolster both your skill checks and your telepathic abilities, the Soul Knife gains the titular Soul Knife to use as a weapon, acting as psychic knives that you pull out of your brain pouch and toss a confused and soon to be brain stabbed enemies. As you study the blade of your mind, your psychic die will start to affect your knives, enabling them to hit better, and letting you toss one out into a fight and then teleport to where it landed like you're the yellow flash of migraines. You can also turn yourself invisible, and your final ability enables you to rub a magnet on the brain of your bad guys to stun them for a whole minute. Compared to the Phantom, I still think that the Soul Knife doesn't have a specific role, but its abilities do lend more to the thematic idea of mental skullduggery. Plus, you can replace the knives with cards and roleplay as Gambit, so this is my favorite rogue class now. Next up, the Sorcerer gets a bunch of new features to augment their meta magic, but nothing to actually get more sorcery points, so get ready to drain them fast or otherwise never use them. Specifically, you can use your metamagic to reroll attack rolls, and you can finally change the damage type of your spells, although only to elemental damages, which is still a step up, but I can feel that struggle to not nerf the sorcerer more. Beyond that, you can finally swap cantrips and metamagic every few levels, you can spend sorcery points to reroll ability checks, which is not metamagic, you just get it for free at level 5, and you get oodles of new spells, both from Tasha's and from the PHB. You even get new spells from your subclasses, like the Aberrant Mind, the final psionic subclass that foregoes the psychic die of the last two for the amazing flexibility of being able to replace place the subclass-specific spells that you get from the Aberrant Mind with either a divination or enchantment spell from either the Sorcerer, Warlock, or Wizard spell lists. It's a really weird feature to wrap your head around, but it opens up the world of spells to the class that should need them just as much as the Wizard. Past that, you can also telepathically talk to your friends, cast spells directly through your sorcery points so that they don't need any components, gain resistance to mind effects, transform your body with magical thought energy to see invisible people fly, become a fish person, or do that weird scene in Harry Potter where your bones turn into jelly, and your final ability turns you into a black hole, crushing everything around you before shunting you through space and spitting you back out somewhere else. The Aberrant Soul is a very good class for players who want versatility in their game, on a class that was already designed to bend its skills to fit the situation. I do think that the skills, especially the spell swapping feature, are a bit confusing, so I'd err on the side of caution before suggesting it to a new player. But once you understand the basic mechanics, the Aberrant Soul should be a real thinking adventurer's class. Speaking of thinking, do you know what emphasizes thinking? Clocks. And do you know what doesn't make for a clean transition? Clocks. The Clockwork Soul Sorcerer is a magician tainted by Mechanus, the outer plane of pure order where everyone is shapes and you forgot to turn in your your geometry homework. Your magic takes on a vaguely robotic design that seems very out of place in the high fantasy Forgotten Realms, but since it's actually from a foreign plane of existence, that displaced feeling is secretly brilliant. Mechanically, the Clockwork Soul gets new spells and the same spell swapping power as the Aberrant Mind, but instead of choosing between enchantment or divination spells, you choose transmutation and abjuration spells. And you can balance advantage and disadvantage rolls by taking away one of the dice and telling that person to roll normal. With the power of sorcery points, you can place wards on people that absorb damage, you can enter a Clockwork Trance that negates advantage, prevents you from rolling lower than a 10, and can be reactivated if you pump sorcery points into it, and finally, you can harness the power of squares to summon an army of modrons that fly around, restoring balance by healing people, fixing damaged objects, and ending spell effects of 6th level or lower. The Clockwork Soul operates as a subclass for those that want to future-proof their encounters. Most of the abilities either neutralize advantages that your enemy has, or prevents you from making overly negative mistakes, so if you're the type of player who has unreasonably bad luck rolling your die, you can use this subclass as a security blanket. Up next, the most customizable class is given new spells, new invocations, and a new Pact of the Talisman, which is really bad, don't take it. But 
can also now swap out its features every few levels if, in your creative experimentation, you got locked into a playstyle that you don't really care for. The Warlock also has some of my favorite subclasses in the whole book, the Fathomless and the Genie. The Fathomless is what happens when you throw enough rotten fish off the side of the boat, and an ancient tentacle deep god thinks, man, I love fish, this guy's the best. With the powers of being able to buy homes from people affected by global warming, you become a bastion of the sea, summoning watery tentacles that fight with and alongside you, as well as gaining gills and a swimming speed. As you dive into battle, you'll handle cold temperatures better, you can talk underwater without inhaling salt water, your tentacles can look out, sir, you or your allies, you learn Avard's black tentacles for maximum penetration, and you'll one day learn to swaddle yourself and your friends in so many writhing tentacles that they all fold space on one another and thrust you into the tentacle dimension before spitting you out somewhere else, soggy and cursed with knowledge of the tentacle dimension. The Fathomless is your obligatory water subclass for the Warlock, but outside of a couple of water-specific abilities, you don't lose a lot of strength for being away from the ocean, you just sort of bring the water with you. Or maybe that's just sweat. Gross. As for the Pact of the Genie, where there's a will, there's a way, and the Genie is your way to play the Elementalist Warlock that you've probably never even thought about. As opposed to the other patrons, the type of Genie you pick will have an effect on your character, as the Pact of the Genie gives you new spells to pick from depending on whether your Genie is a Jinn, an Ifrit, a Marid, or a Dao. And their element provides specific buffs, like dealing more elemental damage when you hit. Your Genie also provides you with a housing vessel for you and your friends, protecting you from the outside world so long as you can excuse the itty bitty living space. As the power in your corner grows, you gain resistance to your Genie's chosen elements, you learn to fly, give your friends 10 minute short rest when they hop in your vessel with you, and your final upgrade gives you the almighty power of the genie, the power to wish. Not only do you get wish as one of your subclass spells, but at 14th level you can beseech your genie to grant you the power of one spell of 6th level or lower. Like I said, the genie warlock is an elemental powerhouse, and if you find a way to reflavor the vessel mechanics, you could just use the subclass as a template to play the avatar that the monk could never give us. Holy hell, we're almost done. Okay, last class is the wizard. You can replace cantrips every long rest now, and that's not the wizard being flexible, that's just the wizard flexing. You also get one and a half new subclasses, the order of scribes, and the blade singer. The blade Singer is a little weird. It originally showed up in the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide, the place where subclasses go to die, and it was brought back in Tasha's with minor buffs, namely that your blade song uses scale with proficiency now and aren't just set at two, and now you can replace one of your attacks with a cantrip when you get your extra attack. Those are worth mentioning as being buffs, but they don't change my overall opinion of the subclass, so you can find me talking about it in the OG Wizard Spell Guide. TLDR, it's fun, it's powerful, but if you do manage to get hit, you'll be reminded you're a wizard, Harry. As for the Order of the Scribes, it is best practiced by those wizards who talk to this spellbook like it's a real person, because to the Order of the Scribes, it is. Acting as a sort of pseudo-generalist wizard, you'll be handed a quill with the powers of being a really good quill, and a book with a mind of its own that can be used as a spellcasting focus, as well as a means to cast rituals instantly and swap around the damage types of your spells so that no resistances will ever harm you again. That book mind will eventually manifest as a full-on magical floating head that can see in the dark and belch out spells as if they came from you. You'll also learn how to scribe your own spell scrolls, and your bond with the magical head will grow as it helps you recall magical information, and in times of extremely dire need, it'll look out, sir, for you when you get hit by a powerful ability, then burn a bunch of your spell pages so that you can't use them for a while. And those spells take multiple days to recharge, so whatever you're blocking better be worth it. The Order of Scribes is complicated, to say the least, which isn't bad because it's an archetype for the thinking class, and for people who don't want to specialize in one school of magic, and instead take the field as far as it'll go, the Order of Scribes is one of the more rewarding subclasses in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. <laughs> But that'll about do it. I hope you enjoyed this video. Be sure to leave a like, comment, subscribe, ring the bell to stay up to date on all of your Davy news, and maybe support me on Patreon so that I can prepare for the next time that I have to review over two dozen subclasses. But yeah, Davy out.